something I've noticed in the Dragon Ball fandom is no matter how obscure a piece of media is, I feel like it'll always be talked about and rung up every once in a while by Dragon Ball fans. So it's kind of weird to me that a movie that seems forgotten and rarely ever talked about is Dragon Ball GT A Hero's Legacy. I myself have only seen the movie once and it was when I was a little kid and despite how young I was, I still have some vivid memories from watching that movie and really loving it when I was younger, even crying in certain parts. And even though I've only seen the movie one time, I've always thought back on it with fond memories to this day. I was thinking about the movie again recently and how it's hardly ever even talked about these days and I wasn't sure why. I was like trying to think back, but I wasn't sure if I only enjoyed the movie because I was a kid or if it was actually good because you know, we always perceive shit differently when we're younger. Rose tinted glasses, all that nonsense. So I decided to rewatch it for the first time in years. Um, cool, join me on this journey. Let's take a look back together. Let's kick it off on one of my favorite parts about the original GT. The first thing that really struck me when pressing play on the movie to begin with was the theme song playing. I'm watching the movie in dub. Please don't come at me, so people like, I I'm not trying to have a debate. I'm not trying to have a war. Everyone has a preference. I I'm not even going to go into it. I'm just going to move on. And I was watching it in dub, so what I would have expected to play was Grand Tour, uh, less than great opening, you know, the one from the dub for GT, but instead, it played a dubbed version of Dan Dan. I butchered that, and that's why I laughed. I don't, I don't know how I'm supposed to pronounce that as a non-Japanese person. Don Don Dan Dan. Well, fucking whatever. Dan 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 is one of my favorite songs in the whole series of Dragon Ball, from the beginning all the way to modern day. But I've only ever heard it in Japanese. I don't know if I'm like one of the few who haven't who hasn't heard the dub version. But hearing this English version for the first time was like a really pleasant surprise. And it had great lyrics that fit the theme of a grand adventure. And I just really enjoyed it. So I felt like that was something I should add. I could be the only one that's ever like not heard the dub version of Don Don. But like I, I, I was caught off guard and it was really enjoyable. There were some nice lyrics like typing up an adventure. And it really fit Dragon Ball's vibe. After the start of the movie, we open it with Goku Jr. He's the great, great grandson of Goku, a hundred years in the future from the end of Dragon Ball GT. He's also Pan's grandson. We see them training together with some beautiful scenery and backgrounds. Something that I'll be commenting on multiple times throughout the movie. It just looks really pretty. Pan is trying to toughen up Goku Jr. because he's a shy kid and often gets scared of conflict. I adore the little callback of him rolling on that piece of wood reminiscent of Goku doing that. Same thing at the very start of Dragon Ball, literally the first panel of the manga. Such a small detail, but a really nice callback. Despite Goku Jr. struggling training with Pan, Pan tells him she reminded him of Goku in every single way, especially his appetite. I love the atmosphere of this movie a lot. Seeing an overshot of the city as well as Goku's school in detail just really gives off good vibes. I don't really know how else to put it other than it's just a really nice feeling. I get the same kind of feeling from the Ghibli movies. I don't know, it's just good scenery goes a long way. World building, whatever. Goku Jr. gets confronted by his bullies after class ends. The main bully's name is Puck, who seems to be the leader of his group. They steal Goku's pen after calling him a coward and saying that they can't believe that Pan's grandson wouldn't even try to fight back. Thanks for the rocket pin. Loser! Hey, you stink! Okay, I am truly horrified of the kid making chicken noises. God knows what the fuck is going through that brain. We can see Goku Jr. is scared after that encounter with his bullies and really wanted to just get out of there as soon as possible. When he went home to tell Pan, Pan scolds him for not standing up to himself. There were three of them, Grandma, and two of them were a lot bigger than I am. And one was making chicken noises. While yelling, Pen would unexpectedly collapse. We go over to the hospital, and it is actually really sad to see Goku Jr. scared of losing his grandmother. It doesn't feel very Dragon Ball. He's pleading for his survival the whole time, and it's all very sad stuff. I absolutely adore Pen telling Goku Jr. that being scared is okay and using Gohan as an example that some people learn through fear and eventually use those emotions to overcome it and grow stronger. I love it, it all makes perfect sense for his character. Pen tells Goku Jr. that the real strength is having the courage to stand up for what's right. She once again tells him that he's just like Goku in every single way, telling him she loves him before her health issues start to get worse. Goku Jr. is forced out of the hospital and has to go home himself. This whole thing is so like oddly real and you could truly feel his sadness just watching his reaction to his grandmother the one person he has in his life who is slowly dying and him pleading for her to live is a upsetting sight 
and as a kid, I remember this scene making me super emotional. He remembers what Pan told him about the Dragon Balls and Shenron, the wish-granting dragon. He makes it his mission to find what he thinks is just one Dragon Ball to make the wish to restore Pan's health. I love the plot of this little kid who doesn't know what he's getting himself into, set out on this grand adventure, being guided by his heart and his desire to protect his loved ones. Goku begins his journey to Mount Pao's where he believes the Dragon Ball to be. On the way, he bumps into his bullies again and oh fuck, it's chicken, dude. So what then? You running away or did your grandma throw you out because you're a coward? Huh? Oh, no. He's making more noises? After being scared for my life seeing Chicken Kid again, Goku Jr. just walks past the police and continues his journey. In a situation where he would usually be scared, his heart and care for others gave him the strength to pay no mind for the people that were in his way. As he continues his journey, he begins to feel exhausted. Goku Jr.'s bag is clearly way too heavy for him to carry for a long period of time, so he stops to take a rest. A man in the truck pulls up and offers Goku a ride. Seems like a pretty nice guy. He even offers Goku Jr. a bite of his burger, which turning down was definitely a smart idea because I don't know how many diseases this man has, but still a nice gesture, I guess. After eyeing Goku's food, he pulls over and advises Goku to quickly use the bathroom so he won't have to hold it in during the long duration of the trip. Hey! You forgot your pack! <laughs> What do you mean? <laughs> Thanks for the grub, kid. What? <laughs> hey, come back here! You've got my stuff! What the fuck? You know, we've had some really heartless villains throughout Dragon Ball, but I think this guy takes the cake. Literally. Goku continues his journey on foot with no supplies and an empty stomach, and eventually bumps back into Puck, his bully. Puck seems a little bit looser when he's not around his friends, and even though he still tries to maintain the image of a tough guy, he still gives Goku some advice and wants to help him out. Puck tells him you can't trust people on the road, especially nice people. Puck tells Goku about the demon lord King Yao who lives in the forest of Mount Pao's, and that if he's going to get eaten alive, he at least wants to watch which is an excuse to tag along. He then admits to respecting the courage of Goku traveling to such a dangerous place, so Puck wants to stick with him through his journey. Puck then goes inside and steals a shitload of food for Goku and himself to eat on the journey, getting away as fast as they can on a cart. Stealing may be wrong, but Puck is a real one for that, and I'm actually growing pretty fond of his character. They make a lot of progress entering a forest area after a while. Here we see them messing around, just having fun, becoming friends. <laughs> Uh, if, if pissing together makes them closer, then I don't know. Who, who am I to, who am I to do? Then they eye over the cliff, getting a beautiful view of Mount Pao's, which is in the distance. Their end goal is in sight. When it gets dark, they make a fire and begin to make food. Back to my same old bullshit that I was saying before, but I love this atmosphere too. Something about a campfire in the forest is just really pleasing. Please give me better scripted words on like what emotions I'm feeling towards these sceneries that are making me feel good vibes. <laughs> Goku opens up to Puck about Pan's illness and how he came out here to find a Dragon Ball to make her well again. Puck is in disbelief that someone as strong as Pan is dying and has a lot of respect for her. We see that Pan taught Puck a lesson about weapons in combat and that he should use his fists instead. Puck returns Goku's pen in what's actually a really nice moment, but that nice moment does not last long because they then get surrounded by a bunch of hungry wolves. They're in danger, and Goku's about to be eaten until his instincts, mixed with his fear, is able to give him a burst of strength, jumping up to safety. Goku and Puck eventually get saved by this random woman who takes them back to her house, caring for them with food and warm beds. Another moment of great atmosphere, I'm sorry, but I have to keep bringing it up. The house and scenery is absolutely beautiful and really cozy. But the feeling of coziness does not last long. We find out that this lady is a human-eating monster, and only brought them back for the purpose of eating them. Boy. Certainly is that? <laughs> what the fuck? It's the fucking chicken! The kid is the chicken! It all makes sense. He formed a temporary alliance with Puck in his human form, waiting for the perfect moment to be able to eat him. Okay, if you haven't seen this movie before, I I'm just kidding, but the fact that this kid from earlier was making chicken noises and now there's an actual fucking chicken as a protagonist is a hilarious coincidence and my jaw literally dropped when I was watching this. The lady waits for them to go to sleep, planning on killing them and cooking them. But before she went in to kill them, Goku started to get a bad feeling about her. She enters their room and stabs what is now an empty bed. Goku says to Puck, you said it yourself, never trust nice people when you're on the road. However, all this commotion of Goku and Puck talking brings the attention of the human-eating lady who throws them into a room with a giant pot. It was a very fun fight sequence showing Goku and Puck desperately try not to be eaten. I really enjoyed it. After spilling the pot filled with hot water, Goku and Puck are able to escape the woman's trap, running to get away. 
After some time, they reach an unsteady bridge, and Goku is once again overcome with fear and is too scared to cross. After taking a long time, heavy winds start blowing the bridge, rocking it back and forth, eventually breaking the ropes. The bridge splits in half, and Goku is hanging for his life over a deep pit. In an act of selflessness, bravery, and growth, Puck rushes over to save Goku Jr., lending him a hand and trying to help him up. Unfortunately, they weren't fast enough, and while Goku was able to swing to safety, Puck was not as lucky, falling deep into a pit below. I really enjoy Puck as a character, despite his short time on screen. I think the character fills the role they were trying to do perfectly. I love the idea that Goku Jr.'s kindness and pureness rubbed off on Puck, just like Goku himself did to many of the enemies that he faced in his past that would later become his allies. It really does show that the characters are more alike than the movies just showing up front. After mourning the loss of his friend, Goku continues his journey. He's a scared baby bear who is about to be eaten by a monster. Initially, he's too scared to do anything to protect this bear, running away as fast as he can. But as he's running, he remembers the strength of the people who were there for him, Puck and Pen. Puck gave his life to help Goku, so Goku, not wanting anyone else to die because of him, turns around and runs to help the bear. We see that this monster is one of the human eaters that was back at the monster's house. He recognizes Goku and is eager at the opportunity to get to eat him all to himself. As he's about to be in another burst of strength caused by not only fear but the eagerness to protect someone else, this being the bear, blasts the human eating monster far, far away. After this, the bear's parent then comes out and is about to attack Goku to protect their child. However, in gratitude, the little bear tells their parent that Goku helped save their life. I'd love Goku Jr. having bonds with animals in the wildlife a lot because this really hasn't been explored since Goku was a kid all the way back in the original Dragon Ball. It makes sense and is really cool that he has a connection to animals just like his great great grandfather did and I really enjoyed his friendships with the bears. As they venture forward, they once again bump into the human eating monsters who are out for revenge. Goku and the bears then make a run for it. you look rabbish in that way. pick his little eyes out. I love this movie. After running for a while, they all bump into the previously mentioned Demon King, Lord Yao. Lord Yao is a giant creature who kills any human being that enters his forest. He begins to attack Goku in an attempt to eat him, but the bears protect Goku and try to keep him safe. The bear's parent tries to hold off Lord Yao, wanting Goku to take the little bear and flee. The little bear doesn't want to leave his parent behind, and then starts to run back to help. The bear once again squares up to Lord Yao, but doesn't stand a chance as he picks up the bear and is about to kill it. The baby bear is panicking, fearful at the chance of potentially losing their parent. Out of seemingly nowhere, Goku then obtains the power of a Super Saiyan. It's a very abrupt and different transformation than we usually see in Dragon Ball, but I actually really like it. Goku Jr. is sick of people losing their lives protecting him. Pan spent so much of her time and energy looking after him, making sure he was okay, training him to be more confident. Puck just died for him. These bears are about to die for him, and his pure heart, as well as strong Saiyan lineage, gives him the strength to transform into a Super Saiyan. Whether you think him transforming was necessary or not, it's a hell of a lot better than that back tingle bullshit that Super was talking about. But back to what's going on, with his newfound strength, Goku is able to defeat Lord Yao, protecting his new bear friends. They finally reach their destination, Goku's house. It appears to be run down, but after some looking, Goku Jr. finds the four-star Dragon Ball. He places it down and begins to wish for the dragon, requesting that it would restore Pan back to good health as well as bring Puck back to life. Nothing happens, he begins to cry. He thinks his whole journey was for nothing and it was a stupid fairy tale. But despite not having the magic of all seven, the four-star boss certainly holds a special magic of its own. Goku himself then appears and has an incredibly heartwarming conversation with his great-great-grandson. He tells him he's brave and did an amazing job on his journey. We then see the amazing news that not only is Pan alive, but Puck as well. They fly in on a helicopter and reunite with Goku Jr. As they fly off, Goku tells Goku Jr. that it wasn't the Dragon Ball that brought back Pan and Puck, but instead his courage and love doing it by himself. He tells him he's proud of him and to stay pure, and that's his armor. Goku Jr. then keeps the 4-star ball, feeling a similar connection to it as Goku did when he got it from Grandpa Gohan. A touching and absolutely beautiful ending to a fun and amazing film. Genuinely, got chills and I'm gonna light it up a bit. What an absolutely beautiful message and story. So, that was Dragon Ball GT, A Hero's Legacy. Revisiting the movie was truly a treat and I loved it. 
it captured the feel of a grand adventure far better than GT ever did. So it's kind of wild. It was made at a similar time and told a touching story of the heart that carried a hero through his journey. I loved this movie as a kid and watching it back, it aged really well. I still do now. If you still haven't seen this movie for yourself, you should definitely watch it. Or at the very least, seek out that last scene of Goku and Goku Jr.'s conversation. It is genuinely amazing and all Dragon Ball fans should see it. It's a shame I don't see this movie talked about anymore. I think it's up there with the best in the series for me, and it was super enjoyable throughout. So, did you enjoy it? Did you enjoy the video? Tell me what you think. Leave a like. Love you all. Take care. Subscribe.